Okay, so this lecture is about the cardiac cycle. As you can probably appreciate, the heart squeezes and relaxes in a sort of rhythmic manner. This repeating cycle is called the cardiac cycle. And there are a few important terms and a couple of different ways to visualize the events of the cardiac cycle, and that's what we're going to go through in the next few minutes. First off, a little reminder. These are the rough, approximate, normal pressures of blood entering and leaving the chambers of the heart. We say that the systemic arterial pressure is normally around 120 millimeters of mercury systolic and 80 millimeters of mercury diastolic. Systolic and diastolic, what does that mean? Well, when a given chamber of the heart is contracting or is contracted, we call that systole. So here's a more formal definition of ventricular systole. Ventricular systole is the phase of the cardiac cycle during which the ventricular muscle cells are contracting or contracted. When the muscle contracts, it generates pressure inside the chamber. And if the pressure gets high enough, this valve will open. In this case, we're looking at the left ventricle. If we're looking at the left ventricle, then this valve would be the aortic valve and this would be the aorta. And when the left ventricular pressure becomes greater than the aortic pressure, the, aor the aortic valve opens and blood flows out. That's all systole. The other part of the cycle is called diastole. So ventricular diastole, formally the period of the cardiac cycle during which the ventricle is relaxing or is relaxed and filling. During diastole, the pressure becomes low enough for the mitral valve in the left heart to open and for the ventricle to fill. So we can look at these processes in terms of the pressure and volume in the left ventricle as functions of time over the cycle. So in this plot, we're starting in diastole. The pressure in the ventricle is low, a few millimeters of mercury, and the, vent and the pressure in the, in the, in the volume is high. Uh, say here, it's about 120 milliliters. So when systole starts, several things happen relatively quickly. Pressure increases in the left ventricle. The pressure increase immediately causes the mitral valve to close because the pressure is higher in the left ventricle than in the atrium. When the pressure gets higher than the aortic pressure, the aortic valve opens and volume in the chamber starts to go down even while the pressure continues to rise. So, so see here how the volume goes down during, during this part of systole. At some point, we're done ejecting, pressure in the left ventricle drops back down below the aortic pressure, so the valve closes. Ventricular pressure drops as the chamber continues to relax and aortic pressure starts to slowly decrease as the aorta and the large arteries drain out down to downstream vascular beds. And when the, when the left ventricular pressure drops low enough for the mitral valve to open back up again, the chamber starts to fill. During diastolic filling, there's a shallow, sort of slow, shallow increase in pressure, which is due to the passive, meaning not actively contracting, elasticity of the myocardium. Okay, and then the whole thing starts all, starts all over again. So here's all of that plotted with a little bit more realism and detail. So if we look here at diastole, which starts here, we see that during diastole, we have filling of the relaxed ventricle. This curve indicates atrial pressure. And we can see that atrial systole precedes ventricular systole and that atrial systole contributes one last extra kick in filling the ventricle right before ventricular systole. So after atrial systole, ventricular systole. And, and what happens during ventricular systole, you have an increase in pressure in the ventricle, which leads to an opening of the aortic valve and ejection of blood into the aorta, which is, happens here, leading to an increase in the aortic pressure. And at the end of ejection, the aortic valve closes here. The peak systolic arterial blood pressure is called systolic pressure. The minimum diastolic pressure, which occurs at the very end of diastole, is called diastolic pressure. So this diagram also shows you how heart sounds and events in the electrocardiogram line up with events of the cardiac cycle. And we can use this diagram to introduce an important concept called ejection fraction. What do you think ejection fraction means? So ejection fraction is the fraction of the end diastolic blood volume that is ejected from the ventricle in systole. So here, at the 
end of diastole, there's about 130 milliliters in the ventricle. How much is ejected? So 130 minus 50 or about 80 milliliters. So the ejection fraction is 80 divided by 130, about 62%. That's a perfectly healthy ejection fraction. In fact, this is a, all a perfectly healthy, normal looking cardiac cycle. End diastolic pressures are nice and low. Ejection fraction is nice and high. Arterial pressures are not too high. There's nothing funny in the electrocardiogram. Okay, you'll learn later on how deviations from normal indicate, and normal on, on some of these, these numbers indicate patho pathological situations. Next, we wanna look at a different and complementary way to visualize the cardiac cycle. So on the left is, is what we just saw, plotting pressure and volume as functions of time. Here on the right, we're plotting pressure in the left ventricle versus volume in the left ventricle. So this plot is called the ventricular pressure volume loop. So the pressure volume loop or cycle, it's a, it's a loop or a cycle because the heart operates cyclically via the so-called cardiac cycle. So we're plotting the same variables on the right that we're plotting on the left just in a different way and, and not explicitly showing time. So to see what's going on, let's start here. So this point in the cycle is called end diastole. So let's just label it with a, with a number arbitrarily, let's call it number one, right? That's where we're starting. So number one here on the right, corresponds to this time on the left, where volume's at the max, but systole has not started yet. So after, after some point, after the ventricle has filled with blood, the ventricle contracts, causing an increase in pressure in the chamber. That's this part of the pressure volume loop. This phase of the cardiac cycle is called isovolemic contraction. So on the time course plot on the left, you can see that isovolemic contraction is relatively quick. The end of isovolemic contraction, we can label it number two, here on the right, and that corresponds to this time point right here on the left. Okay, so why does isovolemic contraction end? It ends because the aortic valve opens, the chamber starts to empty, so volume's not constant anymore. Okay, so volume's going down, and when volume's going down, that phase is called ejection, okay, because the blood is being ejected out into the, into the arteries, into the aorta. So ejection ends when the aortic valve closes. It's here on the right, here on the left, okay? Once again, at this point, both valves are closed. So when diastolic relaxation starts, volume stays constant. So we call that isovolemic relaxation. Very good. The next phase is the filling phase. So that happens when the mitral valve opens here on the right, okay? Here on the left, point number four. On, this, on these plots, okay? And so the ventricle fills right back up again and we go around the loop again. So keep in mind, the corners of this thing, this pressure volume loop are valve opening and closing events, which are, which are what we're labeling here. Okay, so same question again. What's the ejection fraction here? Okay, and we can, we can, we can just about read the ejection fraction off the pressure volume loop. That's one of the reasons why the pressure volume loop is, is kind of useful. Uh, the end diastolic volume, the maximum volume here is 120 in this case, and systolic volume is something like 45, so 75 milliliters of the blood is ejected. So by the way, 75 milliliters is called the stroke volume. So the stroke volume divided by the diastolic volume is the ejection fraction, the fraction of the volume that gets ejected. 75 milliliters divided by 120 milliliters equals 62.5%. Once again, good news, another healthy patient, right? So the, by the way, the normal range for ejection fractions is considered to be something like 50 or 55 to 70%. Something below 50 is potentially indicating systolic dysfunction or, or reduced contractility in systole. Remember, cardiac work is the work done by the heart over some specified time in pumping the blood. Cardiac power is the rate at which cardiac work is done. Now for a new related definition, stroke work. Stroke work is the work done by the ventricle over one cardiac cycle. And it turns out that the stroke work is equal to the area enclosed by the pressure volume loop. And that's one of the reasons why visualizing pressure volume loops helps us to think about the mechanical function of the heart.
So why is the area of the pressure volume loop equal to the stroke work? Well, it's really most important that you understand and know that the area of the pressure volume loop is equal to the stroke work. The why is not as important, but let's try to understand it nonetheless. So remember, pressure is a mechanical energy density, energy per unit volume. If you add volume to a system at a given pressure, the work done to do that is equal to the pressure times the change in volume, right? So if you add pressure to a system at a given volume, the work done to do that is the volume times the increase in pressure. More generally, work is the sum or the integral of pressure times volume. So down, down, down here in this diagram in diastole, when the heart is filling, work is being done by the inflowing blood on the walls of the heart. And we see that here. Um, this area is the integration of pressure times volume during filling. During ejection, the heart is doing work on the blood. And that's this area here. And so finally, the network done by the heart during the cardiac cycle is the difference between these two areas. That's the area enclosed by the pressure volume loop. So at this point, um, that might seem like some kind of a theoretical concept, but you're going to see later how thinking in terms of pressure volume loops is going to help you um, through a number of concepts that come up in cardiology. So one, one simple example, imagine the case of hypertension. So if systolic and diastolic blood pressure were to increase like so, the pressure volume loop might look like this. So here we've not changed stroke volume, so we're not getting any more or less cardiac output per beat, but the stroke work has increased a lot. The heart is, doing, is, is working a lot harder to pump the same volume of blood per unit time. And finally, just to wrap up on the cardiac cycle, and just for fun, some, some history, which I think is, is kind of neat. The first person to consider uh, and study cardiac pressure volume relationships was this person, Otto Frank. So, and um, this, is a, this is a plot from a paper of his from 1898. So one of the things he's plotting here is the developed systolic pressures as uh, functions of volume under different conditions. So, so these curves are a demonstration of what has come to be called the Frank-Starling mechanism. So um, Otto Frank is the Frank and the Frank-Starling mechanism. Um, the first person, these experiments from Frank were done in um, using isolated frog hearts. The first person to observe these, these kind of phenomena in um, mammalian hearts in vivo was Ernest Starling, and he's the other name attached to the Frank-Starling mechanism. You'll get a lot more on the Frank-Starling mechanism uh, later on. So um, this curve here, this is, this is the frog heart relaxed pressure volume relationship. So this curve has come to be called the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, the EDPVR. Uh, in this paper, Frank also sketched out here what the idealized pressure volume loop of the cardiac cycle might look like. And he recognized that this area is the work done over the cardiac cycle. So he figured all of this out at the end of the 19th century more than 100 years ago. So really, to me, pretty impressive, cool stuff.